So let's finish with this. And that's a brief review of drugs. Now, when y'all give drugs to kids, you know that there's only two different ways to do any procedure on a child. And that's called drugs or no drugs. Unfortunately, as you well know in children, a fair amount of time we tend to use no drugs. That involves brutane. Brutane is otherwise known as brute force. Otherwise known as I'm bigger and therefore I win. Brute force involves a relatively simple concept and that's called I take this unsuspecting young lady right here. People in the front row, you are completely safe. You are gutsy enough to sit in the front row, you are completely safe, I will never pick on you. Everybody else? You know what? <laughs> Still appreciate it. It's a nice fringe benefit. What's your first name? Sherry. Hi, Sherry. I'm Scott Pleasure. What we do with Sherry is relatively simple. We take Sherry, we lay her up here on the floor. We get a bunch of y'all to come on up and hold Sherry down. Out of my bag, I whip out my handy-dandy metal laryngosco blade. And without the aid of drugs, we're going to orally intubate Sherry. Well, as you can imagine, Sherry's not real gung-ho on this whole concept. So she's kicking, biting, screaming, cursing. But alas, you know what? There's more of us. We're bigger, and therefore, we win. And as we hold her down, I put the blade in her mouth. I break her teeth. I tear up her tongue. Somewhat traumatically, by the grace of God, I force a tube through her cords. And yes, I could do it. And unfortunately, I'm sure you all have seen it done. Is there a better way? Absolutely. And that's to talk to two very famous people still alive in America today. <laughs> Number one, Elvis. Why? Remember what did Elvis the King have to say about drugs? Just say yeah, baby. <laughs> even more topical though, you have to talk to the acknowledged master of airway management who does not even know that he is the master of airway management. And that's Johnny Cochran. Now, y'all remember Johnny Cochran at the end of the OJ trial? Remember that incredibly famous quote on the front page of every newspaper in America? You remember? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Fabulous line. Now, turn Johnny Cochran into an anesthesiologist. <laughs> and what would Johnny C would actually teach you is relatively simple, and that's called you must sedate if you want to intubate. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I don't care if you want to talk to Elvis or Johnny C, you got to give people drugs. Case in point, Tasha. Tasha's a horrible four-year-old asthmatic. When you show it to pick her up, clue number one, she's standing on the bed. Clue number two, breathing in his 70s, heart rate 176, saturation 74% on continuous NEBS. Despite IV steroids, does she need to be intubated? Yeah. Can you intubate her standing on the bed? No, I've tried. You just can't do it. Therefore, what is your options? A, hold her down. Why would you do that? B, what did Tasha do after three milligrams of IV Versed? Lay it right down. <laughs> And that's a beautiful thing, because as we described earlier, if you can get them when they're doing something, they'll be discharged doing something. Therefore, if you're going to intubate a kid, here's a brief review of the method of the madness. If you are indeed are going to intubate a child, you walk in the room, hi, how are you? Here's some atropine. Because atropine wards off all the evil spirits. Why? What does atropine do to the goobers? It dries them up, and it's good, because when I intubate, I want to see cords. I don't want to see goobers. And what kind of a face do you want to tape it to? Dry face. There you go. Everybody's happy. Take that one step further, though. What does atropine do to your heart rate? Makes it go up. And that's good because, remember, when kids get hypoxic, they <coughs> drop their heart rate. When you put a big blade in their mouth to try to find their cords, they drop their heart rate. As we'll show you in a minute, when you give them succinylcholine to briefly paralyze them, they profoundly drop their heart rate. If you look at a sick kid funny, they drop their heart rate. <laughs> Therefore, atropine is a beautiful thing. Now, some physicians will teach you that especially in the context of increased pressure in your brain, you can give them a slug of lidocaine before you intubate to try to numb the brain. Does it actually work? Eh, we don't know. Some studies seem to say yes, some studies seem to say no. But most of the current literature says, you know what, if you know their brain pressure is high and you're going to have to intubate them, you probably ought to try it. Throw a little lidocaine in there. Why? Why? If it works, great. If it doesn't work, big deal. You push one more drug. But in the context of increased brain pressure, it probably is worth a try. Then you have to remember, does the drug take away pain or only put you to sleep? People have a vision that Versed is the wonder drug. Why? It is. It's a great drug. What does it do in 90% of America? Makes you go to sleep, makes you not remember as well. That's a wonderful combo. But what does Versed do for pain? Nothing. You're asleep, but your body still is in pain, still reacts to being in pain. 
Therefore, in your handout, the sedatives are under sedatives, the analgesics are under analgesics. They are two separate categories of drugs, which means if you're going to do something nasty, they really need both kinds of drugs. Now, I have to admit to you, first lecture of the morning, what my soapboxes are. That way there's no misconceptions throughout the day. First one, as we'll talk about after lunch, give scandalous amounts of morphine to burn patients. Number two, don't paralyze patients. Now, especially for those who work in ER or critical care, why do we love taking care of chemically paralyzed patients? It doesn't get any better than this. They are fabulous to take care of. They give us absolutely no trouble whatsoever. They're very coercive. Whatever procedure we want to do, it's a great day at work. However, the problem is, as we'll show you, there's only two kinds of paralytics. And that's called sucks or MIV and everything else. As we'll show you in just a minute, the short-acting ones are very appropriate to put the tube in. Everything else is when y'all start pushing Narcaron and Pavulon and Rock and Cis and all those other fancy long-term paralytics. The problem is you push the paralytic, now they don't move, but are they asleep? We don't know. All we know is that they're not moving. Now, this is called BIS. BIS stands for bispectral index spectra something. People just refer it as BIS. And this came out of the operating room a couple years back because anesthesia had a problem with people waking up during surgery. And they determined this was a bit of an issue. So nonetheless, what they came up with was this. This is a modified EEG. Essentially, all you have to do is they put three little leads on your head. It hooks up to a monitor and it gives you a number. Gives you a number between 0 and 100. 100 means you're wide awake talking and smiling. 0 means you are dead. And now, whether you are paralyzed, sedated, chemically in a coma, whatever it might be, simply by looking at a number, you can actually tell how actually sedated are they. It's really kind of a nice idea, both in critical care and actually now into the ERs as well. People are starting to experiment outside of the OR with biz and having really good results, especially for people that are paralyzed. So why is this a problem? As we said, you push the paralytic, they're not moving, but are they asleep? No. Paralytics only paralyze. Why this is an issue is before I stopped doing transport a couple months back, I went after a three-year-old pediatric trauma, walked into the ER, asked the nurse, what did the child get for sedation? The answer was Norcuron. What did the child get for pain? The answer was Norcuron. What did the child get to make him X? So still the answer was Norcuron. Gotta love it. One drug does it all. Not the case. Meanwhile, the child has a heart rate of 180 and a blood pressure the same. Why? He's in pain. He's awake. He's scared out of his mind. And what can he actually do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Can he move? No. no. Can he tell anybody? No. no. That's a problem. Therefore, when y'all give paralytics, they have to be asleep. And they have to have something for pain. Now, you remember Sherry? We took Sherry. We held her down. We shoved a tube down her throat. And that was anything but pleasant. Except when we talked to this young lady right here. Good morning. <laughs> Tell me this is not a sense of power like you have never felt before. <laughs> What's your first name? Cardella. Hi, Arnella. I'm Scott. Cardella. Good morning. I'm sorry? Cardella. Cardella. Okay. What we did with Cardella is even better than what we did with Sherry. Because Sherry, we held her down and that was bad, but Cardella wins the Powerball lottery for $300 million. Announces after a brief two-week vacation that she's going to return to work full time. It could happen. <laughs> But before she does this, she's decided to take a trip she's always wanted to take, which is a tour of the Amazonian jungle. And going through the jungle, seeing things she's never seen, having a fabulous time, she unfortunately has the misfortune of hearing this. <coughs> Quickly followed by this. What did Cardella just get hit in the butt with? A blow dart. Very good. What's the name of the blow dart? Curare, very good. A relative of Norcuron, Pavilon, Cis, Rock, whatever you want to call it. What does Cardella do? Collapse. No, she runs. <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> For about three or four steps, she falls flat on her back. And this is when things get bad, because now, out of her peripheral vision, she can see the natives appearing at the clearing with much anticipation in their <laughs> eyes. Even worse is Cardella can hear the unmistakable as the drums of increasing intensity summon the natives 
to dinner. <laughs> and just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, Cardella can feel them as they tie her to the stick, oh. bounce her through the woods, and put her where? In the pot. <laughs> and what can she do about it? No. Nothing. Can she move? No. no. Can she breathe? No. no. Can she scream? No. no. Do they care? No. They only paralyze. Therefore, if you all are pushing paralytics, they got to have something to go to sleep. they got to have something for pain. And as we'll show you in a minute, you need to make sure if you push a paralytic, you need to know how long it lasts versus how long your sedative lasts. The reason being is that Versed lasts about half an hour. Fentanyl lasts about half an hour. Pavilon lasts an hour, which means they go to sleep. They're pain-free. They're not moving. Life is good. But what happens after half an hour? They wake up. They can't move, they can't scream, they can't do anything, but they're still not moving for another half an hour. Therefore, what all you're gonna give, make sure that they're asleep, make sure they're pain-free, and that one equals the other. So, better living through chemistry. Now, unless you all do anesthesia or transport, you do not get to pick which drugs you want to give. Unless you've ever worked in a teaching hospital setting with interns, residents. Because then you know you actually have two choices, right? A, I've drawn these up, do you want me to push them? Or B, I push these, is there anything else you'd like me to push? <laughs> Either way, what that simply involves is this. If you're going to intubate a kid, hi, how are you? Here's some atrophy. Something to go to sleep, something to take away pain, give them a short duration paralytic. Again, it's detailed in your hand under short duration paralytic, sucks or MIV. They go in fast, they go away fast. If you can't put the tube in, you don't have to bag them for that long. After you put the tube in, you give them more sedation, more pain medicine. Are you noticing a trend? And you ask yourself, would you want to be pavilionized? No. Can you think of anything scarier than being awake, paralyzed, and unable to do anything about it? How would you want to look if you were intubated? <laughs> and very appropriately so. If you look in pediatric critical care and actually slowly catching up on the big people side, the big trend is not to paralyze people anymore. After the tube is in, the big trend is just to push sedation and pain medicine. Because if you push sedation and pain medicine, it has a nice synergistic effect, and they stop moving. And the reason they're not moving is because they're asleep. It's because they're pain-free. That's a really nice combo. Now, a couple years back, Pete's Anesthesia came to our transport team and asked us what we thought was a stupid question. They said, why are you paralyzing my children? I said, well, that's easy, because I just tubed them. And I don't want them to sit up and rip out their endotracheal tube. They said, if you give them enough sedation, if you give them enough pain medicine, they will act paralyzed. So, all right, play devil's advocate. What about if they're still moving? They're not sedated enough. Now, then they whipped out their trump card. It's so, all right, you want to play? All right, how do you know if a chemically paralyzed patient is seizing? Well, that's not fair, unless you have continuous 24-hour EEG. You don't. How do you know if a chemically paralyzed head injury patient, as we'll show you, is trying to posture and trying to go like this or trying to go like this? Well, that's not fair. You don't. How do you know if a chemically paralyzed patient is awake like Cardella, sitting there in the pot, scared out of her mind? For the most part, you don't. Because in burn or trauma, you're always tachycardic. Therefore, you've got to throw that out the window. Therefore, you know what, if you give them sedation, you give them pain medicine, they don't move. And if the reason they don't move is because they're asleep and pain-free, it's a really nice combo from the parents, from your and the patient's perspective. 